uh, chairman of the he's also uh, chairman of the Conseil d'analyse économique which is the um, essentially the French Council of Economic Advisors which advises the French prime minister so it's a very important uh, role so Philippe's research focuses on international trade and uh, macroeconomics has been highly impactful and recognized uh, Philippe has uh, numerous publications in the top economic journals as the American Economic Review the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Review of Economic Studies and others, and has a very large number of citations. And in addition to his academic impact, he has had significant policy impact. This uh, includes, of course, his appointment as the chairman of the uh, um, Conseil d'Analyse Economique, but also a broader presence in the public debate in France and uh, abroad. Philippe studied at Sciences Po, and got his PhD from uh, Georgetown. And prior to rejoining Sciences Po, he taught at a number of prestigious institutions such as uh, Paris Sorbonne, the Paris School of Economics, the London School of Economics, and the Ecole Polytechnique. So uh, without further ado, I welcome Philippe to our uh, podium, to our virtual podium. And I very much look forward to his uh, address. Everyone else while he's speaking would mute themselves and also stop the video, that would be great. You want to stop sharing slides, um, Veronica? Stop share. There you go. All right, Philippe, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I guess a good morning for many of you. Uh, thank you very much, Dimitri, for these uh, very uh, kind words and kind introduction. And I'm uh, extremely honored to, to, to give this uh, presidential address. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, as uh, Dimitri was saying, uh, um, I'm very much at the border between uh, theory and, and, and economic policy. Uh, I'm the chair of uh, the Con Con Council of Economic Analysis. And, what I will try to do today, indeed, is to uh, give a, a talk that uh, bridges uh, uh, both uh, uh, policy and, and economic issues on, on the motivation that we've seen a rise in uh, protectionism and try to understand some of these uh, determinants. Um, so let me try to share. So let me share my, my screen. That would be better. Can you, can you see it? Yes. OK, let me. Excellent. Um, so, so, so this work is based on, on, on work with uh, Samuel Delpech and, and Etienne Fils, who are both at Sciences Po and at the, at the Conseil. And in a sense, it's kind of uh, 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 reflecting the, the type of work I do, which is indeed uh, at the border between international macroeconomics and, and, and international trade. And this is the, very much at the core of, uh, of my interest. So let me give you some motivation uh, for, for the, this, uh, this, this work. And I will start with some tweets, uh, both by Donald Trump and, and, and Joe Biden. Um, these tweets, I think, make quite clear uh, that, um, at least in the, um, in the, in the mind of uh, uh, former President Trump, there's a link between uh, uh, trade imbalances, both at the bilateral and multilateral level, and and the kind of uh, 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 concern uh, um, that uh, Trump had on 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 trade, uh, meaning that the trade deficit was was a bad thing, and trade in the sense of trade multilateral, but also some bilateral trade deficits, especially here he gives the example with Germany, but as you know. He was also very much concerned uh, with, uh, with China. Now, we know that, of course, with Donald Trump, this, uh, this was, uh, was uh, very strong, very stark, and sometimes quite aggressive. Um, but in a sense, one message I want to, to provide in this lecture is that uh, this rise of protectionism is maybe not completely linked simply to one president. But there are maybe more structural uh, features in the rise of protectionism and in the determinants of this rise of protectionism. Philippe, I think your slides are not, uh, are not moving. We just see still the first slide. Ah, OK. Uh, thanks. So let me maybe still, still you still uh, see, see only the first slide. 
Uh, me at least. I don't know if um, okay. other... Yeah, no, we're just seeing the first slide. Okay, so, so let me, I, I know what to do, I think. Yeah, just change it to slideshow maybe. Yeah. Um... Is this better? Yeah. 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 There we go. Good. Okay. So, so miss, you missed the Trump's uh, tweets. Oh, here they are again. But I guess you could have guessed what they are uh, in terms of saying how bad the, the trade deficit and the bilateral trade deficits are. But again, if you, I've, I've just uh, shown also this uh, tweet by Joe Biden to see that the concern on trade deficits is is, is not over. Uh, and there's something added, and, and that explains part also of the, the title of the, the lecture, which is that, um, as you see, uh, President Biden is also concerned that the fiscal stimulus uh, that is, uh, as, as you know, has been extremely large, uh, may actually um, uh, be beneficial uh, too much for to the foreigners that there's some leakage of this uh, uh, um, uh, fiscal stimulus. And, and that uh, may also be a concern, which is linked obviously to, to, trade, uh, to trade policy. So that's going to be a theme of what I'm going to say to that uh, trade deficits um, and, macroeconomic, and the macroeconomic uh, uh, motivations for these trade deficits may be at the, uh, at the source of a structural rise in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in protectionism. And, and that's, that's what I want to, to go after. Actually, I was helped this week because, um, as you may have heard, um, there were some declarations also by uh, Commerce Secretary uh, Raimondo, uh, who also uh, uh, was concerned about the fact that uh, uh, there's a need to protect uh, the US manufacturing. In the Wall Street Journal, they were not very uh, um, nice with trade representative Thai, uh, saying that uh, she offers a China policy that is trump light. Uh, I'm not sure I, I would go with this uh, this quotation, but you see the type of concern that uh, that we can have. That is that the Trump trade policy and, and protectionism is indeed uh, not uh, not over. In fact, um, by President Biden has maintained the Trump tariffs on European steel and aluminium, and there's no intention to leave U.S. tariffs on imports from China. Uh, now. If you look at indeed uh, the evolution of uh, protectionist attacks, and I will come back a bit more in detail in a minute on the way uh, uh, one could define this, uh, this, uh, this uh, protectionist attacks. Uh, the source is the Global Trade Alert uh, website, uh, which is a very rich uh, data set on which I'll be a bit more detailed in a, in a second. What you see that is indeed that uh, uh, you've had a, a rise, and, and this is not, uh, of course, a, a surprise, of both the announced and the implemented uh, uh, trade attacks in terms of rise in tariffs in particular by the US. This is the black, uh, the black line that, uh, that you see. But you see that actually this was already on the rise before, before Trump. Uh, so this is something on which I come back in the sense that the rise of protectionism as generated by this issue of uh, uh, trade deficits, uh, both bilateral and multilateral, is not only uh, first is not only U.S. It's not only Trump, uh, and that is a, a more uh, prolonged phenomenon. One one thing that um, also can motivate the, the type of empirical work I'm going to show is that if you look at the number of attacks uh, by the U.S. on different countries. And clearly, China is, is an obvious out, uh, outlier here. There is a seemingly, and at this stage, it's obviously only a correlation, some correlation with uh, the bilateral trade deficit of the US with each of these countries, China again being very much an outlier. But even if you exclude China, you kind of see some pattern that uh, countries that have a larger bilateral trade uh, surplus in, this, in their case with the US uh, uh, do, uh, do, uh, do um, 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 get more attacks, uh, protectionist attacks from, uh, from the US. So the kind of questions um, uh, I'm going to ask in this, in this lecture and in my present line of work is to what extent indeed uh, the, um, the factors uh, uh, that explain the rise of protectionism uh, 
uh, of macroeconomic uh, 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 nature, to what extent trade imbalances, both bilateral and multilateral, which are themselves partly linked to macroeconomic policies, predict protectionist attacks. And uh, as you know, trade economists uh, are not that much concerned by bilateral and multilateral trade imbalances. Bilateral, because basically, and, and I fully understand this, uh, this uh, line of th thought that you know, bilateral trade imbalances uh, reflect the comparative advantage, and we should not uh, care too much about uh, the fact that there are bilateral trade deficits and surpluses. And as for multilateral trade imbalances, as, as you said, Lino, also, there's been a concern, but mostly by macroeconomists macro about these uh, global imbalances on, on multilateral uh, trade imbalances, but not that much by trade economists. Uh, in a sense, uh, one message is that trade economists should care about bilateral and multilateral trade imbalances if indeed they are uh, um, uh, uh, good predictors uh, of the rise of uh, protectionist and, and trade tensions. Um, obviously, and, and this, is, this, this is renewed with the COVID crisis and the large fiscal stimulus that, uh, that have been put into place uh, in, uh, in different countries and especially in the US, um, uh, there is a, a, a concern that international differences in fiscal stimulus, you know that the American fiscal stimulus is much larger, and I'll come back to this at the end, than the European uh, uh, stimulus or the Chinese stimulus, to what extent this may generate trade imbalances, and in this case also generate protectionist tensions. So from that point of view, uh, I think that uh, uh, there's a, potentially a strong case for coordination on global imbalances, not only for macroeconomic reasons, but also in terms of trade policy reasons. So there's a large literature that integrates trade and international macroeconomics, and I've uh, modestly uh, 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 contributed to this literature because I consider myself to be at the border between these two fields. But mostly it's been about, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few examples, but from, from trade uh, to macro in particular, what is the impact of protectionist policies or trade policies in general on macroeconomic uh, uh, equilibrium? Uh, there's less from macroeconomics to trade policies, and that's in some sense what I, I'm going to try to, to, to do today. Uh, so indeed, on the macroeconomic consequences of the rise of protectionism, there's been quite a lot of, of work done that has been done, very interesting work on what has been the, uh, the impact of the, the Trump trade policies on, on prices, on welfare, um, to what extent uh, we can think that there may be some uh, short-term stimulative effect of tariffs uh, that are not fully uh, uh, taken away by uh, by. Um, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, real exchange rate appreciation. Um, there's also some, uh, some work that has been done on the impact of tariffs on, on trade imbalances. Typically, uh, uh, the literature finds uh, very little effect. And also uh, uh, the, 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 the fact that the labor markets uh, uh, react to trade policies and, and trade imbalances. But as you see, and this is from trade to, to basically to, to, to macro. Um, now, there is a literature, and in some sense here, it's, a, it's also an old literature on, on what, what are the, uh, the, 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 the origins of, uh, of protectionism. And, and here, obviously, uh, there's a lot of uh, literature that stresses the political economy dimension of this rise of protectionism in terms of internal motives, but also on, on, on trade wars and, and retaliations. On the macroeconomic motives, there's much less. There's a paper, um, uh, an important paper by uh, Bagwell and Steiger um, that uh, looks in particular at the, uh, the impact of, uh, of, um, of the business cycle, uh, also on the exchange rate that by Bonnefroy. This is something um, I, I'll say word on, but more as controls uh, rather than uh, focusing on uh, the importance of the business cycle and the importance of the exchange rate, as you understand by now, I'm going to concentrate on the issue of, of, of uh, bilateral uh, trade imbalances and, and multilateral trade imbalances. So, so indeed, this is uh, the last point that uh, I, will, uh, I will mostly uh, uh, focus on. OK, um, so let me say a few of the results of, the, uh, of, this, um, of this research. Uh, 
Um, by that time, I think you guess where I'm going uh, in the sense that uh, indeed what we find is a strong uh, uh, impact of bilateral and multilateral trade imbalances on, on protectionist attacks. I'm going to focus on the, uh, on the period 2009-2019. Um, I gave as a, as a motivation the, the Trump uh, uh, trade policy, and, and I think it's, uh, it's uh, for, for obvious reasons, but, and indeed, I will tell you that it's stronger for the US and this, uh, this determinant of, uh, of trade policy, uh, and, and for the Trump years, but not only. And, and that, I think, has important consequences for what's to come in the, in the future. We do find that as in uh, that uh, bilateral exchange rate uh, do matter uh, uh, from that point of view. So if your, your bilateral exchange rate uh, uh, um, uh, or your partner's bilateral exchange rate depreciates, that's going to induce a, an attack on, uh, on, on your partner. Um, it's, I'm, I'm going to say a few words on, 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 an, on the way we, uh, we identify this, uh, this causal impact, uh, but uh, the, 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 and that's going to be using fiscal imbalances and fiscal policies. That's interesting in terms of identification strategy, but more than that, I think that the, uh, the import, the, it's interesting per se in the sense that fiscal policy may be itself uh, at, the, uh, at the origin of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a rise in trade tensions. Um, and I'll try to argue that actually it's quite significant, at least in the, in the, in the G20 um, countries. So let me say, I mean, most of the contribution of this, uh, of this work is clearly empirical. Um, um, I, I just want to, to put uh, a, 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 a short theoretical framework, but I'm going to be very short on this because clearly the contribution is more empirical than theoretical. But basically, it's a way to frame the question and to show that a simple theoretical framework, even though very ad hoc, and there's a very, um, it's not a, a, a general equilibrium model, uh, it's, it's a very simple and very ad hoc model. So it's more to illustrate the kind of mechanism we have in mind than uh, a, a, a true general equilibrium model with, uh, with, uh, with all rings and bells. But basically, this is uh, um, a framework where we think that. Uh, policymakers care about manufacturing, production, and employment in a monopolistic framework, and where basically you have to choose uh, on which country you're going to impose tariffs. And there's going to be a trade-off, uh, and this trade-off is, is going to uh, generate uh, a prediction on, on, on the fact that uh, you want to uh, uh, put tariffs more on countries with which you have a, uh, a, a trade uh, deficit. So basically, the trade-off is the following: is that if you, when you put a tariff on countries with which you have uh, a lot of imports, uh, that's going to decrease foreign competition. That's going to increase employment. Um, but on the other hand, uh, if there is a potential uh, expected retaliation, uh, you may lose because uh, this country, uh, by putting tariffs on your exports, you're going to it's going to hurt employment in your export sector. And that's going to be basically the trade-off. And that's going to naturally uh, generate a situation where you want to put tariffs on countries with which you have a bilateral deficit. By the way, of course, uh, you can think that this is too simple and one should think about what happens to consumers. And we can put that into, into the framework as long as basically and um, more or less the policymakers will uh, put more weight on the employment uh, motive than on the uh, 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 inflation, uh, imported inflation uh, uh, impact of putting a, a tariff on, on your import. But basically, to make a long story short, if you look at what is the impact of putting um, uh, by country H on, on country I, a tariff on country I, what is the impact on, on employment in your, in your country? If you take these two uh, uh, issues, uh, lowering uh, competition on your import competing sector, but potentially uh, uh, lowering uh, uh, GD, um, employment in your export sector because there could be some retaliation. At the end, what happens is that, in a sense, quite naturally, uh, you have some uh, prediction that is uh, uh, that shows that the gain in terms of employment is going to be larger. Uh, the, the more 
uh, imbalance your trade deficit, your trade uh, uh, relations with that country I is going to be, meaning that the gain is going to be larger if you have a lot of imports uh, and uh, lower exports. So it's not exactly the bilateral uh, deficit, but it's pretty close to the bilateral trade deficit. And that's what we're going to, to test. One interesting uh, uh, thing in this, in this um, uh, way of thinking is that actually countries that have large total imports um, are the one are not countries that should put tariff uh, on, on other countries. And the reason is that one way to think of it is that um, if you put a tariff on, 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 on China, but you have a large trade deficit with also uh, Vietnam, Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, um, basically, uh, the protectionist attack is going to benefit those countries where there's going to be substitution from uh, exports uh, from China to uh, exports from Mexico and, 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 and Thailand and, uh, and Vietnam. And so from that point of view, countries that have large total imports uh, are not predicted to, uh, to launch more uh, protectionist attacks. Okay, so these are basically the testable implications, and I'm going to, to talk about this, uh, how, how valid they are um, on, on bilateral imports and bilateral exports. And of course, the difference is the bilateral trade deficit, and also on total exports, total imports, and also the trade balance of the country uh, that is your, your partner. Remember, just in terms of uh, reminding the, uh, what H and I are, H is a country that attacks I is the country that is uh, that is the potential attack. Okay, so let me say a word on um, on the data we're going to use, and and then I'll show you a few regressions. But quite quickly, I'll um, I'll um, I'll give you the interpretations and 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 some quantification. So there's a very um, interesting um, trade data uh, which is in uh, in uh, in, uh, in Switzerland actually. Uh, the Global Trade Alert, uh, where they count all the announcements and implementations of bilateral protectionist interventions. Uh, and it's continuously uh, uh, updated. It's, it's the richest one in terms of you know, knowing uh, at a bilateral level, in fact, you have the exact date of the, both the announcement and the implementation. So we work with, uh, with, uh, with the, this, these data sets on the period 2009-2019. Um, there are several ways, and I'm not going to go into technical detail. Um, you'll have to trust me that you know um, we do a lot of robustness checks to to show that uh, our results are robust to the different types of uh, uh, definitions of what what is a protectionist attack. But basically, um, the way the, the 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 way to think about it is that an attack is an increase in a tariff. Uh, we check that we can you know add more different. Uh, different ways of thinking of what is a protectionist attack, but we go for the simplest thing, which is simply an increase in the bilateral tariff on, on imports from, uh, from, uh, from country I. Um, there's, um, it's only on countries which uh, uh, export more than a million dollars, uh, and, and we have different uh, um, uh, ways to, you know, to make sure that uh, for example, the EU, which is, uh, as you know, has a single trade policy. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, for some countries, uh, which uh, on steel, if you take the uh, uh, protectionist attack of the US on, on steel and aluminum exports, um, 74 countries exported more than 1 million uh, of steel products. France and Hungary, obviously, were not exporting as much. But basically, we consider that both countries, in this case, in the year 2018, um, uh, suffered a, a, an increase in their, in their tariff on exports to, to the US. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm focusing on the US, but every, you know, we have all uh, the bilateral trade, trade relations. And I'm going to say that actually, the kind of uh, result that we find is, is larger, more important for the US, but, but not only for the US. So the type of, of, um, of relations we look at is on the left-hand side, we have the number of attacks uh, in a given year, T uh, between H and I, between country, which is the attacker, which is the attacked country. Um, we can have different types of, um, of, of regressions that, uh, that we look at. The simplest one is simply to put the trade balance between country H and I at period T and various controls. Uh, but then the more theory-driven separates exports and imports. 
But um, uh, to make a, a long story short, basically uh, the results are, are very similar one way or another. Um, and, and the type of, I mean, uh, the, given that on the left hand side it's counting, uh, we, we, uh, we have a pseudo uh, um, a Poisson uh, likelihood estimation, which, uh, which is the one that uh, one should take in, the, in this case. Um, okay, so let me show you. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all the regressions uh, because uh, uh, that's that's not the place here. But may, maybe still, let me show you a few of these uh, of these results, um, where the first one uh, is uh, is uh, is a very simple. In all, by the way, in all these regressions, we have your fixed effects. And I'll show you some uh, some regressions with uh, uh, country pair fixed effects because the interpretation of what's happening in this case is a bit uh, is a bit different. Um, so here, uh, indeed, what you see is that the number of attacks uh, uh, is quite well predicted or correlated. At this stage, I should say only correlated with the bilateral trade uh, balance deficit. So a country that has a, 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 a larger trade uh, uh, surplus uh, is going to attack less. And that's the reason why you have a negative sign here. Uh, uh, countries with which uh, they have indeed a, a, a trade uh, a trade surplus, and vice versa. Of course, countries with a trade deficit will uh, will attack more. We have more. We have controls. We obviously have to take care about the fact that some of these protectionist attacks uh, or tensions are uh, pure retaliations because they they retaliate on the attacks uh, uh, in the in the other direction of uh, uh, the current year or the, the past, we, we, we have to check that this is not correlated to the size of countries. And, and the exchange rate also goes in the same way as the traditional literature on this. Um, uh, so that's basically the simplest regression that, uh, that you, you can have, but it's very robust uh, from that point of view. This negative sign is, is very robust. Um, interestingly, when you Put country pair fixed effects. Uh, you get also the same uh, the same uh, uh, sign, and it's also very significant. Uh, it's very demanding, obviously, because when you put country pair fixed effects, what it means is that you say, okay, so if in a given year for a, a country pair, a pair of relations between two countries, in for these uh, two countries, the trade imbalance rises. This predicts that that year and to be more attacks from the country that has a trade deficit towards the country uh, that has the bilateral trade, uh, the bilateral trade surplus. So this is a quite demanding uh, uh, regression, but as you see, uh, it remains uh, uh, significant and, and, and negative uh, in, in, in this case. Um, now, uh, you, you can also add uh, total exports, total imports, and indeed what you find, which is also quite, uh, uh, quite uh, 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 intuitive is that countries that export a lot uh, uh, attack less uh, for, 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 for uh, other countries. Uh, but remember that uh, I was saying that in, the, in the, the theoretical framework, we predict that also the countries that import a lot are not going to be induced to attack a specific country because, again, the, 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 the employment or the production gain of this attack would benefit uh, other countries. Uh, this was my example of if I attack China, if I put a tariff on China, yes, bilateral uh, imports from China are going to, 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 to go down, but actually it's going to be Mexico, Thailand, and Vietnam, which are going to benefit if I have a large uh, level of total imports. By the way, this is not, so, 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 so let me be completely honest here, this is not something that you find in the data. You do find that countries, and I'm pretty sure that uh, most policymakers would have said, of course, uh, if you import a lot, you're going to attack more, uh, even for a given bilateral uh, relations. So from that point of view, the theory is not, uh, is, uh, this one, this part of the theory is not, uh, is not uh, the test is not positive. Um, maybe, and especially for, for the, this audience, um, and I've, I've, I've taken the, the example of the US as a, as a motivation, uh, so, so one interesting question is to ask, to, to what extent this story that trade tensions are uh, in part uh, driven by bilateral uh, 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 imbalances, a US and American story? Uh, 
Um, so what and, and a Trump story also. So so the first regression here, and here obviously the number of uh, observations is much lower. Huh? So one has to be a bit uh, careful about this. But basically, the first regression says that. Um, during the Trump years, the relation was very strong. And in some sense, I think that should not be a, a huge surprise. But if you look at the US during the whole period, 2009, 2019, you do see that even though the, um, the, the, the coefficient is a bit lower, uh, it's, it's not much lower. So, so, so it's not only a Trump story, basically. That's, that's the message here. And I think you, you, you got that part in the sense that I think it's a more structural concern or driver of the bilateral of the bilateral uh, trade tensions, which are linked to the bilateral trade uh, imbalances. Uh, you do see that actually, if you look at this uh, empirical uh, relation uh, and you take away the US, uh, it's still true. Uh, uh, it's still there. Uh, so it's not only a US story, but you do see that the, the, the coefficient is, is much lower. Um, if you look at, for example, Europe, uh, you do find that European countries in their trade policies, uh, when they uh, increase tariffs on, on countries outside the EU, they are also driven by the trade uh, imbalances, but to, to a lower extent than, uh, than, than the US. And it's not only a China story. If you take away China, both as an attacker and an attack country, the relation is, actually, is, uh, is, uh, is still there. Um, uh, so, so here the message is yes, Clearly, the, the, the American trade policy is clearly very much strongly uh, determined by these trade imbalances, but, uh, but, not, uh, but not only. Um, so let me go now to, to and, and this is uh, almost the end. Um, uh, Catherine, if, you, if, you, if, if I'm going over time, just tell me that I'm almost, uh, almost finished. Um, you're, also, you're doing just fine. OK, OK, great, thanks. Um, so, you could and, and you should actually um, have some concern about, you know, okay, it's telling us that there's this correlation between uh, macro imbalances and, and the rise of protectionism, but to what extent is this uh, causal? And I think that's, uh, that's a very fair question that all of us uh, care, of course, when we, we do this type of work. And, and there are reasons for, indeed, you could think that in fact, it's, uh, there's maybe a potential for reverse causality here in this story, because tariffs could reduce both bilateral and multilateral imbalances. If you think that tariffs are going to have an impact on, on trade as policymakers seem to, to think, although as, as I told you before, the, the empirical evidence on, on this, especially on the multilateral imbalances is, is, is relatively weak. Uh, which in some sense is not a big surprise because uh, we know that the current account is basically the difference between saving and investment and in some sense does not depend on, 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 on tariffs. But at the bilateral level, we, we would think that tariffs may have an impact. So, um, so clearly uh, there is a, a source of, of, of reverse causality here. Also, and this is something, this is a story that we've heard quite a bit uh, there's some papers actually trying to, 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 to measure this anticipation effect. If, if you announce a tariff, um, uh, we know that some importers may want to increase bilateral imports because they anticipate that our tariffs is going to increase. So obviously um, they want to uh, 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 use the time before the implementation to increase the bilateral imports. So, so you could have the exact inverse, uh, so, so the relation going in the, uh, in the reverse uh, uh, direction. So we don't know, but uh, clearly there's potential for reverse causality. Um, also, I think uh, uh, it's interesting to understand maybe a bit further, you know, what is the causality chain? Uh, you know, what, what are the structure, what are the, 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 the reasons why uh, indeed, uh, multilateral and bilateral imbalances uh, do matter for, for, for protectionism. And I'm going to tell you that uh, 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 fiscal policy can be used uh, as an instrument uh, for bilateral and multilateral imbalances. But per se, I think in terms of especially of policy uh, debates, I think this is a, a, an interesting thing to look. So what we're going to use as an instrument for uh, uh, imbalances, trade imbalances, is is a fiscal policy or more precisely um, the cyclically adjusted budget balance, which in a sense, as, as you certainly know, is, 
is, is not the perfect but uh, very often used uh, uh, um, measure of what is the stance of the fiscal policy of this country uh, over and above the uh, the, the cyclical uh, the cyclical dimension. Um, as you know, there's, set, uh, there's a very large macroeconomic literature that says that indeed, and that's the, basically the twin deficit literature uh, that says that uh, fiscal policy has an impact on, on trading balances in the sense that countries that have a, a more uh, a fiscal stimulus will increase uh, uh, consumption, demand, imports, uh, may have an appreciation of their exchange rate but also, all this is going to uh, to uh, generate a, a, a trade deficit. So that's the twin deficit literature. So we're using basically this very simple macroeconomic uh, macroeconomic relation. Um, now, this is obvious for the uh, multilateral trade imbalance. For the bilateral trade imbalance, it's a bit more difficult. So what we use is, and there is a recent literature that uh, tries to look at indeed uh, this. Um, how the uh, gravity structure of international trade can be used to think about uh, determinants of bilateral imbalances. So what we do is that uh, basically we look at the difference uh, between two countries' fiscal stance, uh, the di difference in the, the cyclically adjusted budget balance, and then we divide by basically the log of distance because one way to think of it is that, you know, if Canada and, and the US have very different uh, uh, fiscal policies, um, uh, this is going to have a big impact on the trade imbalance between these two countries because they trade a lot because of the low distance. This may not be the same between, say, Australia and, uh, and, and Europe uh, because they are very far away and their trade relations are, are much, uh, much less important. So uh, anyway, this, this, this gravity structure is used here and, and, and there's a uh, good theoretical uh, reasons to, to think that we can do this. Um, okay, so basically, uh, as for any instrumental regressions, we, we, we first check that indeed, uh, 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 cyclically, I mean, the budget balance has an impact on, 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 on trade balances, and indeed it works pretty well and in the way that uh, the theory would uh, predict in the sense that if you have a, a, a larger uh, budget balance, uh, this is going to improve your trade balance and vice versa. If you have a trade deficit, that's going to increase your trade. Uh, if you have a, sorry, a budget deficit, you're going to uh, increase your trade deficit. And the difference uh, between two countries uh, indeed predicts pretty well their bilateral trade deficit. I'm not saying this is the only factor of uh, trade imbalances at the bilateral level. Obviously, comparative advantage would have an impact, but here we should, it, it, uh, it's interesting to show that these uh, macro, uh, macro imbalances have an impact on trade imbalances. And in the, the second stage, indeed, the bilateral trade balance indeed has, remains, have, um, I mean, the, the, the significant and negative impact uh, remains true, meaning that indeed um, uh, the, the line of, of reasoning is that uh, uh, more uh, fiscal uh, deficit generate more trade deficits, which generate themselves uh, uh, trade tensions. And this is true both at the bilateral level here on the left hand side, but also at the at the multilateral at the multilateral level. Um, uh, in a sense, I, I was saying this is interesting because of the instrumental strategy to to to, to verify that uh, you know this uh, concern about. Reverse causality uh, uh, can um, can uh, is uh, is not a big problem, but it's uh, again it's interesting per se because I think that all the debates that we have today on on, on fiscal stimulus, uh, and we already hear in Europe uh, that uh, uh, that some concerns by the US that you know the US is is doing a lot in terms of fiscal stimulus, Europe and US and Japan are doing less. So it's interesting to see to what extent these differences in fiscal policies could predict down the road uh, some, uh, some trade tensions. And so, so basically the reduced form of regression is simply putting you know, the difference in fiscal policies between countries and to what extent they do predict some, uh, some uh, protectionist attacks. And we do see here that indeed this, uh, this, is, the, this is the case. Um, so let me 
uh, and with an exercise of quantification. Is all this important in terms of you know explaining the rise in uh, protectionism? Um, and 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 my answer would be yes. Uh, so it does not explain everything, obviously. Um, but basically, uh, here uh, on the G so here this quantification is on the G20 countries, uh, which are more similar in terms of size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so that's the reason why we do it on the G20. So here, for example, uh, if you have uh, an increase of one standard deviation of the bilateral trade balance of country H, remember country H is the country uh, that attacks. Um, then, uh, then uh, this uh, gener or this predicts an increase in protectionist attacks of nine percent. Uh, the multilateral seems quantitatively uh, uh, more important. Uh, it predicts a uh, fifteen percent more attacks. Uh, if you look directly of the fiscal impulse, and in a sense, it's not uh, it's not very uh, surprising that indeed you do find that um, if you do more fiscal uh, impulse. Again, because this is generating a, 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 a trade balance deficit, this is also going to predict more uh, protectionist attacks. Uh, the real exchange rate appreciation, and as you know, this is something that uh, uh, is very often uh, talked about, the fact that uh, there's potential manipulation, and that's actually in the law, huh? that's, uh, that's a potential reason to, in, at least in the US, to, to put tariffs on countries. It's there, but uh, quantitatively, it looks not that uh, not that large. Um, and by the way, of course, if you've been attacked in the past, uh, that's that's uh, a motive for retaliation. And indeed, quantitatively, it's quite important. But remember, we were controlling for for protectionist uh, past protectionist attacks. So let me conclude. Um, I think at that stage, I think the message of uh, this research is is quite clear. Um, the the we we. The, the, the protectionist attacks uh, under the Trump presidency, um, of course, were very specific, but in some sense, uh, uh, this research says or suggests that there's something maybe more structural uh, behind them. Um, the, the, um, uh, and, and in a sense, and here this is more uh, forward looking uh, and, and potential policy uh, implication is that, and I alluded to that, that in 2021, if you look at the cyclically adjusted fiscal deficit and in the US and the EU, and I'm just taking these two, these two uh, part, trade partners, but I could do it also for Japan, China, et cetera, uh, it's pretty large, uh, as, as you know. Uh, so it's 12% of GDP in the case of the, uh, the US and 5% in the case of, of the EU. So, so our work would predict that, of course, there's going to be uh, some uh, some tensions down the road. Um, in a sense, uh, US could could uh, uh, say, you know, uh, we are the consumer of last resort, and you, uh, meaning the Europeans, are the free riders of uh, of fiscal stimulus, and that gener could generate indeed some protectionist tensions. Uh, by the way, we did, and but I'm not sure. It's not. Uh, I, I, I would not put the. Uh, too much faith in this number, but of course we 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 uh, uh, looked at uh, what our uh, uh, empirical model predicts in terms of trade tensions due to the fact that there's this huge difference in uh, in in uh, uh, fiscal policies between the U.S. and Europe, and this would go uh, uh, towards doubling uh, um, the number of protectionist attacks. So we were already at a very high level. So I'm not saying. There's going to be a doubling uh, compared to Trump because obviously there are other, you know, political or uh, economic reasons for why uh, trade tensions may go down. But the, the 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 trade deficit and the fiscal policy difference itself uh, would generate a big rise in uh, in trade tensions. And 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 here I'm going slightly too far, but basically uh, I would say that potentially this is a reason why indeed. Uh, um, uh, with the Biden presidency, we've not seen a, a sharp decrease in uh, in, uh, in trade tensions between the US and and um, and the rest of the world. Um, so I think, and that's going to be my last word. I think that you know, for macroeconomics, macroeconomic coordination is super important because uh, uh, of the problems, the macroeconomic problems linked to to, to global imbalances, for example. Uh, but I would say that um, there's another reason why we should maybe have more macroeconomic coordination inside Europe, transatlantic and transpacific.
Pacific inside Europe because, as you know, there's also issues uh, uh, between, say, Germany and France, and Germany has a large trade surplus and France uh, has a, a trade deficit. So in some sense, the tensions that, uh, that arise uh, be because of different fiscal policies between the US and Europe, uh, some of these tensions also exist uh, in, in, inside Europe on, on the impact of trade imbalances. Uh, but so what I would uh, say, and this would be my, my last word, is that uh, these discussions, this macroeconomic coordination on in particular fiscal policy in this very moment where we have very large differences in, uh, in fiscal stimulus are certainly necessary uh, and, and a precondition for trade discussions uh, in the sense that having trade discussions, you know, on Boeing Airbus, on, on, on steel, aluminium, all this is, is very important at the sector level. But one should not forget that um, certainly at the origin of these trade tensions, we have these macroeconomic problems. And therefore, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, with the objective of reducing trade tensions, uh, we also have to talk about the macroeconomic problems that may, uh, may be at, uh, at the origin of these uh, trade tensions. So let me stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, um, Philippe. So um, I think now uh, we have some uh, time to um, ask some questions to Philippe and uh, have a bit of a discussion. Uh, Kathy, approximately, uh, we're, we're okay. We can go through that now. Some some questions and uh, yes, right. we have we have plenty of time, so we're good. Yeah, if everyone would uh, uh, share their videos so that we can see you all again. And, uh, okay. Cool. Tune, maybe you have a few questions to get people started, Dimitri. Of course, yeah, yeah. So um, all right, so Philippe, I have a kind of a bit of a broad question, which is uh, what are the, so let's say, take this behavior that you documented as a given. Uh, my question is uh, what kind of macroeconomic dynamics are implied by this uh, kind of behavior of countries that uh, whenever they have high uh, imbalances, then there is a uh, kind of, they become more protectionist. And in particular, I was curious about um, kind of, I don't know if this is kind of the data can is possible make would make it possible to look into this, but uh, whether there is some kind of spillovers across sectors. Let's say, for example, Germany exports starts exporting lots of cars to the U.S. and then um, this somehow pushes us above the threshold that the U.S. becomes more protectionist towards Germany. Would the U.S. impose um, a kind of tariffs in? German cars or also in other German sectors? In other words, would the success of the German car sector help um, hurt other exporting um, German sectors to the US? So I guess perhaps one would have to some, do the sexual decomposition here. But anyway, I'm just curious a bit about the macroeconomic dynamics that are implied by, your, by what you are showing to us and perhaps this, in particular, this spillover effects. Yeah, no, so this is a, an interesting question. Uh, so indeed, in some sense, the next step of this, uh, the, this research agenda is going at, is to go at the sectoral level. And I guess that's what you're, you're, you're pushing for, to, to, to look at to what extent maybe, uh, you know, uh, a trade deficit in the car industry has an impact on, on protectionist attacks in, in, in other sectors. So indeed, this is true. And, and in fact, this is true also when there's retaliation. So for example, uh, when the U.S. put some tariffs on, on exports by, uh, by Europe of uh, steel and, and aluminium, uh, for political economy reasons, uh, uh, some of the tariffs uh, on, uh, on the retaliation side were not in this, in this sector. In fact, they were, for example, I think in orange juice, in completely different sectors, but sectors that uh, were chosen for completely political reasons. And basically, uh, Europeans were hitting uh, sectors that were uh, key, for example, at the Senate, because they were no, they knew that you know they were politically uh, sensitive. So basically, indeed, going at the sector level is 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 interesting, and indeed you can have in some sense collateral damage uh, of you know one type of trade tension in one sector going in towards other sectors. Uh, this has been the case, for example, uh, well, even in France, uh, if you think of, you know, the, 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 I think in the trade tensions, uh, some of the wine from France were uh, targeted, even though, um, you know, that was not the initial issue. So indeed, typically, these trade tensions tend to have uh, a, a collateral effects on other sectors. Uh, 
An interesting other collateral uh, damage effect is that because the EU has a single trade policy, when uh, China, the US, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 puts a tariff on, uh, on, on uh, cars or, or, or other uh, uh, imports from, uh, from Europe, uh, they have an impact on, on all countries, even on countries which don't have a trade uh, deficit. So there's collateral damage in a sense. Uh, there's a bit of, a, I would say, collateral damage of the, the, the trade surplus of Germany, which, as you know, is, is, is extremely large on other countries that do not have a trade surplus. Uh, so it's more a, 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 a intra-European problem in this case, uh, but there's another type of collateral, collateral damage of this type of problems, of course. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, exactly what I was asking. I thought, I think this is kind of interesting, perhaps the, the implications for kind of macro dynamics on, or trade dynamics on, on that would be perhaps interesting. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, uh, Philippe. L let's see if there are um, um, any other questions. Can people either raise their hands or just speak up? Uh, we have any questions in the chat? Or put, yeah. In the, Looks like there's a comment in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, the qu all right. Cool. So, Bardi, do you want to? Um, yeah, this is interesting. Do you, please, do, do you want to? I mean, I'm happy to go over you to, to read your uh, comment, but uh, if you want to just uh, ask straight to Philippe, it's, uh, it's fine as well. Huh? I'm reading at the same time, actually. Oh, all right. Um, so indeed, this is at the very, very micro and more sectoral uh, level question. Um, so I have to say, I'm, I'm not going to be extremely competent on, 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 on the very details of, uh, you know, the technology of, uh, of, of, of this. Uh, so I would have to read, uh, indeed, uh, uh, indeed, this, uh, the, this paper. Um, but let me uh, let me read the last question. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, I understand. So, so indeed, there may be some other um, uh, motives for uh, uh, for tariffs. Uh, in a sense, I guess here you you're thinking of uh, a situation where you know a tariff on on uh, on some goods may uh, may generate some. Um, incentivize some, uh, some innovation. Um, uh, this is linked, I guess, a bit to the infant industry type of, uh, of, of argument. Uh, uh, the, what I know about the empirical literature on the infant industry argument, uh, especially on, on the historical one, is that uh, you know, for, for some it works, but uh, there are many examples where, where it does not work. Um, there's this interesting example during the Napoleonic Wars where uh, there was a, 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 an embargo on, 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 on uh, French imports of, uh, of textile. And there's this paper in the AER that shows that actually the fact that uh, France, by, by accident during the Napoleonic Wars, the, the, the French textile industry was protected, had a positive impact, long-term positive impact on the textile industry. This is one example, but I would not. Uh, I, I don't think I can. Uh, I would. Uh, I would go to, towards generalizing this, especially for the example that you're giving in terms of green technologies. Uh, I'm not completely sure I will have an answer on that. Thank you. Thank you. I. Uh, I was. I was thinking. Looked look like at the. The in the, the uh, uh, coal furnaces in America. They are sequestrating carbon dioxide, which is a great technology. And we do not do this in Europe for whatever reason. And this would put an advantage, at least in the energy prices. But the energy prices are um, not really related to trade, trade deficits, but they are may cost uh, trade imbalances, as we all know, from what we are experiencing in Europe with, uh, with the high energy prices we have at the moment. So that's the background of, of this green, green, green. Okay, no, I understand, but um, you'll accept the, the argument that, it, uh, I, I think it's an interesting argument, but I'm, I'm not sure indeed that my, uh, the, the type of work I, can, I do can, uh, can give an answer to, to that question, but I, I get the argument. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, See, someone here, has their hand raised. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Pierre uh, Rafik, yeah, please go ahead. Pierre, I think you're muted. Better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Philippe Martin. Uh, thank you very much. Merci. Um, very enlightening. Also, in light of your experience, you're talking about the retaliation in, in this bilateral um, or multilateral uh, protectionist uh, wars or whatever you want to term it. Um, I wonder, can, can you um, expand on how much in, you have cases where we retaliate to hurt you as you hurt us? There are cases where we retaliate so that in our in our countries internally we can give an advantage to some sector which for political economic reason we need to support and then there's the case of we retaliate because we need to pretend you're doing something but we don't want to hurt you too much because you're too strong and going to hurt us even more if we do cuz i think these phenomena are happening can you talk a bit yeah. on that so, so, so it's true that um, in the paper, we, um, we mostly use retaliation as a control. We, we want to separate uh, protectionist uh, attacks that are due to retaliation and those that are due to the things that interest uh, us. But retaliation, as I showed at the end, is, is indeed a very important part of uh, the protectionist tensions. And obviously, uh, you know, it, it can be a war that, uh, that uh, with, with no end. Um, so I can I, I fully agree with you that indeed a, a, the retaliation itself is interesting to study because there are many types of retaliations uh, in the same sector in a, in another sector uh, as a, is as a motive in fact for uh, you know you you use retaliation as a as a as a, as a way to to uh, to um, disguise in fact a, a, a fully protectionist uh, policy. Um, there is a, a recent paper I can show it, uh, send it to you if you want, that actually looks much more precisely at the motives of retaliation. So, so, so that's not the core of our argument, but I think indeed, um, especially given that uh, we've seen quite a lot of trade wars, and I'm sure that we're not at the end of these trade wars, understanding the dynamics uh, of, of uh, retaliation is, is an important uh, issue. Uh, but indeed, there is a, a recent paper I cannot remember. It's, it's cited in, the, in, in ours uh, by I think IMF and, and French authors uh, who look at this question. And, and, and indeed, you, you're very right. The nature itself of retaliation is uh, is very different and interesting per se to to to, to analyze. Merci. Thank you. Another question, um, please, Niana, go ahead. Oh, hi. Thanks. It was a very very interesting presentation. I was wondering if the data allows you to distinguish between announcement and implementation date. And if, if it does, probably you looked at it. And is there any difference whether you use one or the other? Is uh, the anticipation effect making a difference, perhaps? Uh, so, so yes, the data is super rich. I, I, do, I do recommend that, uh, that people use it. I think we are the first ones to, to, to use it in an econometric work, but it's very rich. And indeed, you have the date of the announcement and the date of the implementation. Sometimes, actually, some trade uh, uh, announcements are not implemented. That is, you, you announce that you're going to put a tariff, but actually, at the end, it's not. So we do check, indeed, at some point that, uh, that are, you know, whether you use announcement or you use uh, uh, um, uh, the actual implementation date does not change that much. Um, you raise an interesting issue, which is uh, indeed the uh, uh, one could use. So, so it would be a very different paper, but very. Diff I mean, that's very interesting to, in some sense, identify the uh, the anticipation effect by looking at what happens during the period between uh, 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 announcement and and implementation, and looking maybe at the sector level. Uh, at what happens uh, to to you know bilateral exports and imports, we don't do this, but this is a great idea. I think that's uh, that's indeed something that uh, would be super interesting to look at because it's not that easy to to identify this anticipation effect. So so I think that uh, that would be a good uh, uh, research paper indeed, but we don't do it. <laughs> not yet. Maybe next one. <laughs> not yet. Maybe another paper. Yeah. Leave another question. It's a little bit kind of um, maybe a bit too vague, but uh, so 
you okay so you identify this uh, kind of relationship between um, uh, kind of the, ex the extent of imports and the the um, uh, it protection is uh, kind of um, response now can is there any work or can we say can one can say something about the mechanism the exact mechanism through this are which this arises is it because particular industries are lobbying for it is it kind of more like a public opinion thing uh, is it because some people are losing their jobs? I mean, is, it, can, is there anything kind of uh, in the literature or you think something interesting can be said about, about the mechanism? Because this might have different implications about uh, what, what, what the protectionist response is. Yeah, so, so Dimitri, you really want us to go at the, at the sectoral level. And, and, and indeed, there's a, a, a large literature which is looking more at the political economy motives of protectionism. Um, and, and, and you heard maybe the stories about the coal industry, which are, you know, uh, very, uh, so, so the sector of the coal, which is also very much uh, concentrated in some, some states in, in the US. So indeed, there is a literature that shows that indeed there is a lobby power of, of, uh, of some sectors, especially sectors that actually are in, uh, in bad shape, uh, which are doing badly and which ask for protection. So, so indeed, there's a large literature that shows that uh, this motive uh, for, for protectionism is very important and, 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 and goes at the heart, you know, at, at, at the micro level, at the sectoral level, and at the geographical level to, to show the, the power of, uh, of lobbying. Um, I think this is super important. And in a sense, I'm not saying this does not exist. On the contrary, I think this is super important. In a sense, what we wanted to, to put the focus on, because the literature has already put a lot of focus on these micro, sectoral, local sources of lobbying and protectionism. What we wanted to, in some sense, show is that, you know, there's, a macro, there's also a macro story there. Uh, uh, and, and that is important too. Uh, so, so again, I'm not saying at all that you know the micro level is, is or the sectoral level is not uh, story is not important. It's super important, uh, but the macroeconomic story is 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 something that has not been identified uh, uh, in the literature, and that's what we were going after. Yeah. Okay. Very clear. No, and and I understand kind of this is really a sectoral question in some sense. It connects to the but of course the the micro and the macro eventually has to have to connect at some level, right? I agree. I agree. Uh, and in a sense, I think there is a, a yeah, uh, the link between the two um, is, is, is missing. I, I agree. In a sense, there's a, you know, there's this large literature on the micro sectoral lobbying local effects uh, uh, that exists already and that has been uh, super rich. Um, in a sense, we're just adding uh, a bit of this macro uh, uh, dimension. Uh, but in, but you're right that at some point uh, we we would want to to connect the two stories. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very clear. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Miana, please go ahead. No, sorry, I forgot my hand up. <laughs> I oh. Okay. Take it down. Uh, um, um, yeah. Yeah. Please let us know if there is any other question. Uh, Don't be shy. Yep, we have the time. But it's quiet. Maybe you could speak a little bit to historical trends in protectionism. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. I said maybe you could speak a little bit to historical trends in, in protectionism. I don't know how far back your research has gone. Uh, so, so what we look at is uh, is uh, you know the is, is the recent period indeed so so because that's where the rise of protectionism has been strong but uh, it would be interesting to go back in uh, in time as you know there were already trade tensions in the 80s for example um that that was, and interestingly actually if you think about you know the the twin deficit story uh, arose for basically with the, the the twin deficits of reagan uh, and that was already a time of trade tensions uh, between the U.S. and 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 the and the rest of the world. So um, one could go back in in time. The problem is is a bit of a problem of data uh, because there's not uh, that, there's not a, a good data set that looks at the bilateral uh, you know the date of each uh, attack with an identification of the sector, the two countries, etc. Uh, etc. Et so one would have to actually 
you know, uh, build uh, the data set uh, to, to go back into history. Um, even more interesting uh, would be to go back to the, the 1930s, for example, mm -hmm. where we know that there, uh, there were big uh, uh, trade wars and to understand to which extent uh, these trade wars uh, were indeed related also to, to trade imbalances. That, that is something that indeed would be very interesting. I, I, my I mean, um, my guess is that indeed during the interwar period, uh, the, the rise of protectionism was, was indeed partly, again, partly uh, a, a macro story too, and linked Thank to you. the trade imbalances, yeah. Oh, looks like Miana does have her hand up. This time is a true hand up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wanted to ask you if you can comment a little bit on welfare. So this macro trade feedback effect, does it affect the way we think about how to compute the welfare effects of this trade retaliation? I think it does, but I, I don't know. I would like to see if what you think. Yeah, thank you. No, it's it's a very good but very hard question uh, because basically, um, if you remember the kind of theory that you need to indeed predict that uh, trade imbalances are going to generate some uh, trade tensions and and protectionist attacks, it's not a welfare driven story because if you think about welfare. Uh, you would uh, we know that uh, in uh, in most of these uh, uh, models. Uh, Except if you have economies of scales and 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 you know um, uh, relocation effects of tariffs, tariffs are bad for welfare. Uh, if you look at the, if we were to put in our model the, the welfare of consumers, obviously uh, tariffs are going to uh, uh, reduce the welfare of consumers. So it has to be that in some sense the the. Um, the political motive of, uh, of policymakers is not entirely based on, on the welfare of citizens, that in some sense, they put a larger weight on manufacturing employment or manufacturing production or pro on, on the surplus of producers than on the surplus of consumers. Um, so in some sense, there's a, a, a clearly, a, there has to be some dichotomy between the, the, the social welfare and the political objectives of, of policymakers. But in, I think um, trade economists uh, should look at welfare, of course, but when you look at trade policy, it becomes very clear very quickly that what policymakers do, whether it's in the US, China, Europe, is not maximizing welfare. Uh, is, and, and clearly here, the political economy story is super important. Uh, and, 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 and in some sense here, we, we are going too far. Huh? We are saying the only thing that matters for policymakers is not the welfare of consumers, it's only, uh, it's only the producer surplus, basically. Um, and that's going too far, I, I fully agree. Uh, but clearly, um, uh, the, the, I, I, I do think that when you look at policy motives, it's difficult to think that uh, politicians are entirely uh, uh, driven by welfare of the society. Clearly, there's you know lobbying on the part of producers, of exporters, of importers, and that's going to uh, to, uh, to to have an impact on the policy decisions. Um, we have actually uh, two uh, questions. So, um, um, Brada, would you please like to go ahead, unmute yourself, and yeah. Okay, uh, I just want to ask like uh, to what extent the rise of nationalism globally in many countries and uh, both in, and in Europe and many other countries, to what extent it is related with the protectionism there, the reason might not be just economic, that might be totally political. And uh, can you shed some lights with some imbalances with the developing countries? Thanks. And to that, maybe there is a re somewhat related question on the chat, which is that uh, since trade imbalances cannot be reversed in the short run, uh, do you think protectionism would be on the rise for a long time? So essentially, predict a bit uh, the future of protectionism through various mm -hmm. factors. 
Yeah, so on the on the on the first uh, question, uh, so, so, so it's clear that again, uh, politics do matter, and they matter enormously, of course, uh, in terms of, of trade. As you know, there's a, you know, in some sense, the rise of populism, the rise of nationalism cannot be completely separated from uh, uh, some uh, uh, discontent on globalization and 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 the fact that uh, you know, uh, as economists, we 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 think that uh, trade integration and trade liberalization is good but we've seen that you know um, uh, in terms of uh, what happens in the, in the in the society this is something that has not been uh, um, very well uh, accepted in the in our societies the rise of nationalism obviously has uh, certainly an impact on on uh, on on the rise of protectionism this is not something that can be discarded this is not something we look at uh, I don't know of, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, but I don't know and, uh, very much about, you know, to what extent there's some empirical work to show that uh, uh, nationalistic uh, policies have an impact on, on trade policies, certainly on populism, yes. Uh, there's, there's a literature that shows if there's a link between the two, that populism has uh, uh, an impact on, on the rise of protectionism. Um, on the on the second question, I mean, this is a. Uh, in a sense, I would say that um, I mean, so the global wave of trade liberalization is behind us. Huh? The the hyper globalization, where you know tariffs are on the on the uh, are falling all over the world, is clearly behind us, and we do see that uh, trade tensions are are very strong. Uh, and, and, and clearly, this is linked also to, to, to the previous question on the rise of nationalism. Um, global imbalances were very strong in uh, just before the global financial crisis. Huh? Um, they are less important quantitatively today. Um, but I would say that uh, uh, this is something that, uh, again, I think is going to, to remain with us. So I cannot predict that you know, the rise of protectionism due to these macro imbalances uh, is going to to remain with us, but this is going to be persistent at least uh, for for a few years. Yes, it's a structural issue. It's not something again. It's not something that is only related to uh, to 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 Trump or Biden or this or that politician. It's something that I would say is, is more structural, and therefore meaning that I'm not sure that I would say that protectionist tensions are going to rise, but they are not going to abate uh, very quickly. Obviously. If I may, uh, just a question on, on your conclusion, you talk about trans-European, transatlantic um, coordination at macroeconomic level. I, I, I don't see the VTO, WTO mentioned there, which would strike to mind as, as, one, as one institution would be presented there. Does it mean that yet you see the, its role waning? I mean, it seems, it does seem that on a regional level, at least Trans-Pacific or the new NAFTA, there, there are endeavors to create regional free trade blocks or anti-protectionists but you're talking about something uh, do you see for instance a possible revival of, of uh, the now long dead ttip transatlantic trade and, and investment partnership for instance and where does now uh, meet you fit in so, that? on your last question my answer is going to be very uh, clear no i don't see i don't see any um any uh, strong demand for uh, further liberalization between uh, between the the US and Europe the problem right now is not that is to to you know to to go back on uh, on some of the protectionist uh, 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 measures that have been taken in the past year so it's not to liberalize, but to, to in some sense, uh, reduce uh, protectionism in the, in the, that has been uh, constructed in the past few years. Um, on, um, on WTO, you know, I mean, let's be clear, this is an institution which is in deep crisis. Um, its main aim was to liberalize trade at the world level. Um, as I said before, I think this is behind us, this wave of liberalization for plenty of reasons, good and bad, but it's clearly behind us. It has not been able to um, uh, 
to rise against uh, the uh, the protectionist tensions uh, for plenty of reasons. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, distrust by the American government, and not only for for bad reasons. I think for some good reasons uh, on 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 the, the WTO. Uh, and if I'm partly right, at least that uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, tensions are at the source of the some of the trade tensions. I'm not sure it's the WTO that is going to be able to help us on that. Uh, here, to be more, you know, macro coordination is more of the, uh, in, the, in the hands of uh, IMF finance ministers. I'm not saying that the WTO should do nothing. Obviously, it has a role to play to try to diffuse trade tensions. Um, but but I, 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 uh, at, at the moment, I think the, the main problem of the WTO is that uh, you know the trade tensions that are linked to state subsidies, for example, in China, um, and 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 all these issues. And again, the problem is that WTO is an institution which, uh, and it's it's a sad uh, conclusion, but which is in deep uh, in deep crisis today. And on the the, the regional level, yes, I mean the the regional integration uh, uh, wave has basically been both a consequence and a cause of the, uh, the, the crisis of WTO and multilateral trade liberalization. Basically, countries uh, uh, you know, uh, saw that it was super difficult to have some multilateral trade liberalization, so they went for regional trade liberalization. And once you had the regional trade liberalization, you know, the, 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 the gain of having this huge uh, trade uh, uh, negotiations, extremely difficult negotiations was looking very small. And that's the reason why you had uh, a rise also in regionalism, uh, but which itself, as you know, is also a bit in, in crisis from that point of view. And, and that relates to the fact that uh, the rise of nationalism and populism also. Uh, and, and more generally, uh, with the COVID crisis, we've seen uh, uh, this uh, in the US, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Europe, is, is a strong uh, desire for I think I would say good and bad reasons. I don't want to 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 be uh, too extreme on that for you know relocation of uh, of uh, reshoring of uh, of the industry, um, and and so so again I think that the era of hyper globalization is clearly behind us. We don't see deglobalization in France. We talk a lot about demondialization or deglobalization. I think this is not true. Uh, we do see uh, that uh, the, the the era of you know, um, liberalization of trade, lower tariff, uh, strong integration is clearly behind us. And I think for a long time, uh, but the rise of trade, uh, for example, just after the end of the COVID crisis uh, right now is, is extremely strong. And we do see that actually we depend enormously on world trade. Huh? All the problem of global supply chains shows that actually we're still super dependent on, 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 on global trade. So in a sense, I would say, you know, it's the end of the rise of, of trade globalization, but it's not a reversal. That was a fabulous talk. We very much enjoyed it. Um, if I could get you maybe to, to briefly stop sharing your screen. We, we have sure. a little presentation we would like to make. As a, a, a token of our appreciation for your years as president, um, it's a little hard to read here, but it, it is inscribed. Uh, it says, in appreciation to Philippe Martin, president, International Atlantic Economic Society, 2020 to 2021. The gavel actually does come off, and you <laughs> actually can, can strike on it and end meetings or call them to order. So it's just a small thing, but we will try and ship this to you. <laughs> Hopefully it will arrive there safely. Uh, but I want to thank you for all the, the work that you've put into guiding the society over this past year and all your input. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much.